My name is uh, Robert A. Williams. I'm a professor of law and American Indian Studies here at the University of Arizona at the Rogers College of Law. Uh, we've asked the dean of our uh, college, uh, Dean Larry Ponaroff, if he would do the welcome. Uh, I will then take over the mic uh, and we will ask uh, Jerry Carlisle uh, from the San Javier District Hill and Odom Nation uh, to give a prayer. Uh, and then we'll start explaining the conference and get it underway. So, Dean, thank you. Thank you. I, I am uh, delighted to do the welcome here this afternoon. In fact, um, I was speaking with some of you uh, at the reception last evening and explained that um, deans are like ornaments, which is to say that we're at the social receptions and offer welcomes at the beginning of programs, and as soon as it gets down to substance, we leave because we have smaller fish to fry. Um, but good afternoon. Uh, my name is Larry Ponoroff, and this is really a wonderful day, and I'm not talking about the weather, although the weather is not bad um, either. Uh, I am the dean here at the Rogers College of Law, and it is my honor, truly, and pleasure to welcome you to this conference and consultation um, with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, James Naya. Um, the conference is being held, of course, as part of the Special Rapporteur's official United States country visit. And the theme of this consultation and conference is the significance of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which I don't have to tell this group was, of course, approved by the UN General Assembly back in September of 2007. Um, we at the college are honored to be hosting this important event in cooperation with the UN Office of um, High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, with the support and sponsorship of the Ford Foundation, the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, the National Congress of American Indians, and the Tohono O'odham Nation on whose traditional lands, I might point out, um, we meet upon um, as we sit here. We take special pride in being able to host this event because the UN Special Rapporteur is, of course, our own Jim and Naya, and we thank him very much for scheduling this event um, at the College of Law. The UN um, Human Rights Council appointed Jim as Special Rapporteur in March of 2008, and he continues to serve in that position, having been reappointed last year for a second term. When Jim is not playing Special Rapporteur, he is a Regents Professor and the James J. Lenore Professor of Human Rights Law and Policy here at the University of Arizona. He is also co-founder, along with our conference chair, Rob Williams, of the college's Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program, which this year celebrated its 10th anniversary. Our college and the IPLP program are very proud to call Jim our own, to support his UN mandate as special rapporteur, and to collaborate with him and the UN in convening this event. I would also note we're very grateful to Jim for the opportunities he's been able to provide for many of our students to become involved in his meaningful work. And of our hope, of course, is that this consultation and conference will help to promote and advance the cause of protecting the rights, human rights of indigenous peoples here in the Southwest, across this country, and indeed um, around the world which is central to the mission of our Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program and to the Law College. Um, and uh, it now, as they say, gives me great pleasure um, to turn it over to the conference chair and the individual most directly responsible for creating at our college, first, the finest Indian law program in the country, and then, as noted, playing the principal role along with Jim and Naya in transforming that program into the premier indigenous people's program in the country. And of course, I'm speaking of none other than the E. Thomas Sullivan, professor of law and American 
Indian Studies, Robert Williams. Thank you very much. And again, thank you. And thank you for that introduction, Dean. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Robert Williams. It's both my honor uh, and my pleasure uh, to chair and call to order this conference. Um, I would not organize a conference for anybody, not even my best friend Jim and I, but I would do it for the special rapporteur for indigenous peoples. <laughs> and I was uh, really, really um, humbled when Jim asked me uh, to help put this event together. Uh, and before we begin, I just want to you know, acknowledge a few folks uh, that did this, that made it all possible, uh, and then go through what we're going to experience the next couple of days. Uh, so that we're all clear on the agenda and, and how we're going to proceed. Uh, the Dean mentioned uh, the funders uh, and supporters of the conference. Again, let me you know, just go through them again. We could not have done it uh, without their help and assistance. Uh, most of you know that the United Nations doesn't provide very much of a budget uh, for these types of events, and yet you, know, you can see just the logistics and all the planning. Um, we're going to be able to host a dinner tonight uh, for you here. Uh, it, couldn't be done without the support of the Ford Foundation, the National Congress of American Indians, uh, particularly the Navajo Nation, Navajo Nation Commission on Human Rights. Uh, and then uh, at the last minute, uh, we were able to call on the help of the Tohono O'odham Nation, uh, who made it possible with their donation to help feed everybody. So uh, they were not mentioned in the conference materials uh, because we really asked for their help at the last minute and they've come through and want to thank them very much. And, particularly all the tribes and tribal folks who've come from so far away. I mean, I've talked to people from Hawaii and California and all over the country. So it's just very gratifying uh, to be able to, to host this event. Shauna Howard, the IPLP staff attorney who organized this conference, where is Shauna at? I want to give her a special thanks. She's also the head troubleshooter for many of our panelists here, if accommodations <coughs> issues or any types of questions there, Shauna. Uh, and again, help put this together. Uh, the IPLP staff, uh, Carrie Stussy, uh, Melissa Tatum, our IPLP director, uh, Claudia N Nelson of Native People's Technical Assistance Office, uh, Ariel Mack, uh, MJ Wienowich. I want to especially thank Rodney Tahe from Navajo Nation for helping coordinate all this with us. All the IPLP students you'll see in gray shirts uh, and volunteers, if you raise your hands, if you have a question, there they are, you see them. Uh, they're here to help you if you need any sort of help, want to know where things are, uh, you know, ask for recommendations for cheap food. Their students, they'll know where to go. So, uh, but actually there is uh, a number of nice restaurants around here in well, and they're, they're here to help you. Um, we are recording, so uh, let me first do that you know, necessity that all conference chairs have to do. Please, right now, turn off uh, your cell phones. I know a number of you probably work at a tribal council where there's like a big bucket or a hat and every time a phone goes off you have to throw in a dollar. So we won't try that yet, okay, but please turn off your cell phones. We are recording. Uh, so as you know, it, it, it's easiest to leave the bathrooms are on this side, the restrooms. Uh, so it's easiest to leave if you walk back up and then come back down around and that way you won't interfere uh, with the camera recording. Uh, we are live streaming this as, as well. I want to thank Michael Wagenheim and his uh, technical crew uh, for helping us do that. So here's uh, the setup uh, that we've planned. Uh, we've divided, and by that, uh, particularly uh, mentioned the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. I forgot, uh, Maya Campbell. Uh, and it is uh, Georgia Passarelli, uh, who are here from the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, they've really co-planned the event with us, uh, as well as co-sponsoring. So I want to thank them as well, uh, while they're here in their official capacity. Uh, as we planned this event and talked about it, uh, the first thing we did was divide up uh, the declaration uh, into four rough categories uh, in terms of the rights uh, that are covered. Uh, and so uh, the first panel, those will represent the four panels. Uh, we're going to have two panels today, uh, two panels uh, tomorrow. Uh, the panels are self-government, uh, lands and resources, language, uh, culture, sacred sites tomorrow, health, education, and development. Uh, we've asked a, a moderator uh, and from two, sometimes three speakers, depending on you know, if people could get here and are willing to do it, uh, to sit on each of those panels. So today our first panel uh, will be self-government. Uh, the moderator will be uh, IPLP Director Prof Professor uh, Melissa Tatum. 
uh, Janet Walker, uh, senior attorney, uh, and then uh, Councilman Wensler Nozan. We'll be doing those introductions. We'll let Melissa do those. Uh, what we've asked uh, the moderator to do uh, for each of these panels uh, is to sort of introduce the theme. Uh, and talk a little bit about the theme in the context of the declaration, perhaps drawing on some of their own experiences. Uh, to set up um, our expert uh, participants, what we've tried to do uh, is find a variety of people, uh, tribal leaders, uh, attorneys, activists, grassroots people. We're, uh, I, th I think if you see the panel, it really is an all-star list. We're really, uh, again, humbled and, and thank our panelists and, and moderators for willing to participate. Uh, we wanted to get you know, some of the best and most experienced people who could bring a diversity of viewpoints uh, to help the special rapporteur, uh, you know, understand the significance of the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Peoples uh, here in the United States. Uh, and so the moderator will introduce the topic, perhaps set a few themes. Uh, I would urge all of you uh, in your packets, um, the Office of Human Rights, uh, Jim's staff, our staff, uh, produced a handbook. I want everybody to pull out that handbook right now. And what we really tried to do, and Jim had a big hand in putting this together as well as the staff, uh, is we all have a common book now, okay? So if somebody talks about Article 35, you can open up to Article 35. We've encouraged our panelists and our moderators to refer to the handbook so we, so we can all begin to speak the language of indigenous human rights. And you know, hopefully you can fit that thing in your back pocket and carry it around with you. Um, so each of the uh, experts, uh, leaders that we've asked to speak, we've asked them to speak 10 minutes as well. Uh, and focus really on uh, you know, one particular problem that they've been working on, uh, where they have a sense that implementation of the principles in the Declaration might really make a difference. So I think we're going to hear some really interesting stories. Uh, at the end of that, we've asked the moderator just to sort of you know, summarize uh, and then set the stage uh, for the comments from the audience. Those of you who have signed up uh, to make five-minute comments. Again, let me stress as strongly as possible. Um, we're all very much aware of the tradition in Indian country of, of people speaking freely, and we all have many important things to say. Uh, but because we all have so many important things to say, uh, we really, really need to keep everybody to that five-minute limit. Uh, and I think probably the greatest honor Jim has bestowed upon me as chair is that I'm the one that's going to ultimately have to tell you to stop. That's my role. So don't be mad at me. Jim's making me do it. <laughs> not, not really. No, it, it, we just really need to do it. We, we, so I, I do want to emphasize that. Please, please don't be offended if you're in midstream and, and we just have to move on because everybody's here. They've come a long way. So I think that's the only forbearance we'll, we'll really ask. Uh, so we will call out five names at a time. I'm going to, again, you know, worried about liability issues. This is a law school, but watch the steps, okay? <laughs> and I may even shout at you, okay? We're going to have students here. But we're going to ask the five we're going to have five people at a time so we can make this move quickly. Uh, the first person will come to the mic and those five will sit in those chairs or if you're coming down from this side, sit there. And then you'll know your name and then when the person is done, you can step up next. So we are going to keep your time. Uh, we're going to have our, uh, watch our signs there. Uh, so two minutes, okay, uh, it'll, and then show them the one that really matters. One minute, uh, zero. Uh, that means stop, okay? And then you'll see me start to squirm, all right? so. So please, uh, so the moderator will be keeping track of the time. Uh, and then, you know, what we've done is, uh, for those who, you know, requested to speak late, who didn't uh, pre-register, uh, we slotted them as well. And so our goal really is to try and give everybody we can the five minutes uh, that, that we've allocated. Uh, and so we will call your name and we'll go as far as we can, as fast as we can, um, you know, during the time allocated for the session. So I think I've got everything right, Shauna, sound right? Okay. All right. Uh, so with that, it is really uh, my pleasure uh, to get this started. And again, thank you, Dean, very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, uh, to introduce uh, the moderator uh, for the self-government panel, uh, Professor uh, Melissa Tatum. She's director of the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program and a professor here at the law school. So Melissa, I'll give it to you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by asking Jerry Carlisle to open us with a prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. 
And since this is a consultation and conference with the Special Rapporteur, let me start by asking if you'd like to open us with a few remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> and thank you, Jerry, for that, uh, for leading us in that prayer. Um, and I'd like to extend my thanks as, as well to all the organizers and those who have supported uh, this consultation, this conference, which is a very important part of uh, my official visit. And that sounds odd because uh, I'm, 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 I live here and this is my home institution. But nonetheless, this is part of my official visit to the United Nations in my capacity as UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And this mission, this visit began uh, two days ago or three days ago in Washington, D.C. and will continue through the end of next week. Um, as many of you know, in 1923, Chief Deskehe, who is the chief of the Young Bear Clan of the Cayaga Nation, of the, of the Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee, uh, traveled to Geneva, to the League of Nations, trying to uh, receive or obtain redress for the claims of his nation and the wrongs committed against his nation by the British Crown and Canada. He went to the League of Nations, but was not successful in, in obtaining that redress. Nonetheless, he was successful in setting forth a very important, or establishing a very important precedent, uh, pre precedent and achieving uh, the status of someone who was a precursor to the indigenous rights movement that took hold, that was to take hold in the latter part of last century, century and that many of you here uh, present have been a part of. I'm talking about the indigenous rights movement that has extended itself into the international arena and to the doors of the United Nations, forging an international indigenous identity and set of demands around common experiences and common aspirations, and forging institutions such as the Working Group on Indigenous Populations, which was the forum at which the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was discussed and initially drafted. Uh, and provided a form, a platform for indigenous people's voices to be heard about that instrument, about what was going to be in that instrument, what should be that in that instrument. So it was eventually, after three decades of discussion about that declaration, about what it should contain, about the aspiration of indigenous people and how they could be accepted by the world community, after three decades of that discussion, on September 13, 2007, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There were only four countries that voted against it. One of them was the United States. But eventually, each of those countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, the United <coughs> States on in December of 2010, reversed positions and endorsed the Declaration. So we can say that the Declaration truly does represent a consensus of the world community about the rights of indigenous peoples. The Declaration affirms a range, a range of human rights norms having to do with indigenous peoples that are rooted in the central idea that indigenous peoples have the right to continue to exist as distinct peoples with their own defining cultural identities and institutions, and to determine their own destinies under conditions of equality. Article three of the Declaration affirms an explicit term, the right of indigenous peoples, like all peoples, to self-determination. In relation to that basic affirmation of self-determination, the Declaration contains specific provisions concerning self-government and autonomy, lands and resources, language, culture, religion, health, education, development, a range of rights rooted in that fundamental right of indigenous peoples to self-determination. The Declaration now forms part of a body of human rights instruments that protect the rights of indigenous peoples at the international level. I think it's fair to say that the, that the Declaration represents a new era of recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples, a new era of recognition of self-determination of the rights of indigenous peoples. Within what we can identify, broadly speaking, as three areas of experience in the history of indigenous peoples. In broad terms, Indigenous peoples have suffered an era of non-recognition of their right to self-determination, and we all know what that's about. Fraternalism and subordination of indigenous peoples and their rights, and worse, of course. If indigenous peoples did have rights during this era, it was the right of indigenous individuals to be citizens like others. So for many states, the prescription for indigenous peoples, the solution to the so-called Indian problem, was simply full citizenship and assimilation, breaking down the bonds that held 
indigenous communities and peoples together. But now we've moved into what can be described as what I've identified as the era of recognition of indigenous self-determination, and this era is signaled by the declaration, by the affirmation of self-determination within the declaration and in other international instruments, and by various numerous developments, uh, both internationally and within the domestic law and policy of states. It is now common for governments to express their acceptance and affirmation of the right of indigenous peoples to self-determination and right, related rights over lands and resources. We hear throughout the halls of the United Nations this affirmation by the representatives of government. We see countries at all, uh, through all parts of the globe, reforming their laws, their constitutions, more or less in line with the Declaration. <coughs> Yet the problem, as we know, is the gap between these rights as they're affirmed in these instruments and their realization on the ground. And so we are still yet to move into a third era, which would be the realization of <coughs> self-determination and related rights. My work as UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a small contribution to helping to promote movement into this third era of the realization of the right of self-determination and related rights, to help try to bridge this gap, this, this gap between these standards, this recognition of indigenous self-determination and its real, effective realization on the ground. As UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I'm mandated by the Human Rights Council, the United Nations Human Rights Council, which is made up of 47 member states of the United Nations, to monitor the conditions of indigenous peoples worldwide and to promote respect for their rights in accordance with international standards, including and particularly the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. To that end, I receive information on an ongoing basis from indigenous peoples from all parts of the world about their particular conditions, about violations of their rights, about violations of these standards that are affirmed in international instruments, and in appropriate circumstances I intervene in, through direct communications with governments and the indigenous peoples concerned in an effort to help promote realization of those rights. I also engage in what I'm doing now, a country visits, going to countries and visiting different places throughout the countries, talking with governments, listening to indigenous peoples in an effort to come at an assessment, develop an assessment, arrive at an assessment of the conditions of indigenous peoples in light of the international standards, and to promote steps to uh, bring conditions in line with those standards. And that's what I'm, I'm doing here uh, today, this week, and next week. As I said, this official visit to the United States began on Monday uh, in Washington, D.C., where I met with various agencies and departments of the government. I met with people at the White House, uh, all the regular institutions that you're familiar with, all the institutions you're familiar with in Washington that, that deal on indigenous issues, talking about what it is the U.S. is doing <coughs> as a government, what it is uh, they should be doing, and what it is they can do better uh, in order to bring conditions of indigenous peoples in this country in line with the, with the declaration and to address enduring deep-seated problems to take the reforms necessary to address those problems. From here, after these two days, uh, we'll be going uh, to Alaska, then from there, Oregon, after that, uh, South Dakota, from there, Oklahoma, and then back to Washington to have debriefing meetings with people in the government. All in an effort to learn uh, in, in, in the framework of this mandate to examine the conditions of indigenous peoples worldwide and to promote needed reforms to bring those conditions in line with relevant international standards. Uh, this event is very much a part of this assessment, very, very much an important part of, of this assessment and of my effort to know firsthand directly from indigenous peoples, uh, your aspirations, uh, your concerns, your proposals for <coughs> reforms. I will be taking this information that I'm gathering here as well as the information I'm gathering elsewhere and we'll be developing a report uh, with the information uh, and with that report there will be an assessment uh, which lays out my views on the extent to which laws and policies and conditions in the United States are in line with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and I'll be making specific proposals for needed reforms uh, in that report. 
the report will be made public, hopefully sometime during the summer months, and then I will be presenting it to the Human Rights Council in Geneva in September. And I urge as many of you as possible uh, to go to the Human Rights Council meeting in Geneva. The Navajo Nation was there last September when I presented my report to the council, and that was very important for the council members, the governments of the world, to hear directly from indigenous peoples and not just from the special rapporteur on, uh, of, the, of the council uh, on these matters. And so I would urge you, if at all possible, to go to Geneva when I present the report uh, and take the limited opportunities available to you there, and they are unfortunately limited to express your views. Um, in any case, the report will be made public, uh, and then it will uh, be up to you, indigenous peoples of this country, to use it in whatever way you deem useful or appropriate. It will, like I said, be an assessment in light of standards of the Declaration, and it will include specific uh, recommendations for reform. And those recommendations, hopefully, will be of a nature that they can help contribute to realistic reforms that will help bring better conditions in the lives of indigenous people, that will help bring us better or more into that third era or closer to that third era of the realization of self-determination. I want to thank all the participants that are here, uh, all of you who are here who have come, all of the speakers who have come and agreed to speak, who, who have prepared papers. I, I know you put uh, effort into that and I want to thank you for that and, and stress how important this is uh, to my work and my ability to uh, contribute to an assessment that will hopefully uh, help move us forward in realizing true self-determination. Thank you very much, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to everyone for being here, for traveling to be with us today and tomorrow. And thank you again to the staff who are all involved in making this conference come together and making it happen. Uh, I have the honor of moderating our first panel uh, the topic of which is self-governance, but since this is the first panel, I'm going to take a, a one small liberty and I'd like to address my uh, just remarks to the larger topic of self-determination and not strictly to self-governance. Because self-determination and the topic of self-determination is woven through all 46 articles of the Declaration. In discussing the topic of self-determination, James and I have stated that self-determination can be understood as a human right that it is the essential idea of self-determination is that human beings, individually and as a group, are equally entitled to be in control of their own destinies and to live with governing, within the governing institutional orders that are devised accordingly. Self-determination means that peoples are entitled to participate equally in the constitution and development of the governing institutional order under which they live and to have that governing order be one in which they may live and develop freely on a continuing basis. The first two articles of the Declaration <coughs> outline indigenous people's place in the world community as equal to all other peoples and individuals and is enjoying the same human rights. The Declaration then turns in Articles 3 and 4 to start with to self-determination and it explicitly provides that indigenous peoples possess the right to self-determination. That means they have the right to freely determine their political status, which includes the right to autonomy or self-government, government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as the ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. The Declaration elaborates that this means indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures, as well as to maintain and develop their own indigenous decision making institutions. That means the ability to determine, based on their own customs and traditions, how their community will operate, who will be members of those communities, and what responsibilities come with being a member of the community. The Declaration requires countries to consult and cooperate in good faith with indigenous peoples concerned through their own represent representative institutions in order to obtain the free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that affect them. Indigenous peoples, particularly those that are divided by international borders, have the right to maintain and develop contacts, relations, and cooperation, including activities for spiritual, cultural, political, economic, and social purpose with their own members as well as with peoples across borders. The Declaration also provides that in exercising the right to self-determination, 
Indigenous peoples do not have to choose between their own community and the country in which they live. Article 5 states that Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, economic, legal, social, and cultural institutions while retaining the right to participate fully if they so choose in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. As part of determining how their communities will operate, the Declaration also provides that Indigenous peoples possess the right to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. This includes, as later panels will discuss, various rights related to lands, resources, education, culture, health, and economic development. This emphasis on self-determination and its role throughout the Declaration emphasizes that self-determination is a pre-existing condition for the ability to exercise any additional human rights. Without self-determination, the spectrum of rights loses its full power and effectiveness. And that's why self-determination is such a critical part of the entire Declaration. With that, I'm going to turn the remarks over to our two panelists. Uh, first, Jana Walker. And Jana is, uh, is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And she is senior staff attorney with the Indian Law Resource Center in Helena, in Helena Montana, where she serves as the project director for Center Safe Women Strong Nations Project. So I'm going to turn this over to her for her 10 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to join this group to discuss the Declaration and its implementation. In my work at the Indian Law Resource Center, we have been seeing a growing, visible movement across the country to use the Declaration to protect indige indigenous rights and to change unjust and discriminatory federal laws and policies. It's my hope that the Special Rapporteur's visit to the United States will further that movement and the engagement between Indian nations and the United States on what changes in federal law are most important, what parts in the Declaration should be implemented first, and how. As you may have heard, the Declaration is not a binding instrument, but it does stand as a very important benchmark, a guidepost, if you will, to evaluate how indigenous peoples are being treated and what legal reforms are needed. On that point, I'm going to be discussing uh, self-determination and self-government rights that are contained in the Declaration, but I also want to highlight the relationship of those rights to the rights of indigenous women under the Declaration. And I want to raise for your consideration as a priority area for reform the critical issue of violence against Native women. The UN Declaration contains 46 articles covering uh, many types of cultural and economic and political rights, land rights, environmental rights, and much more. But the right of self-determination is perhaps the most important right included in all of the Declaration. For the first time in international law, the Declaration is recognizing a new right for indigenous peoples as distinct peoples within the countries. And the Declaration also affirms that indigenous peoples are equal to all others. The Declaration doesn't formally define self-determination, but through its many provisions it contained in the Declaration, it recognizes various aspects of that right. And just to name a few, the right of self-determination of indigenous peoples includes the right to self-government, the right to participate in decision-making affecting them, and uh, many others. All these are aspects that will be part of our discussion over the next two days. The Declaration also contains more than 15 articles that spell out aspects of self-government for indigenous peoples and jurisdiction. Implementation of these rights, along with support from the administration and Congress, could give Indian nations a greater chance for success and prosperity and also could help restore safety to Native women. Part of self-determination and self-government must include the right of indigenous peoples to make and enforce laws to govern their own affairs. And Article 35 recognizes the right of indigenous peoples to determine the responsibilities of individuals to their communities. And arguably, this applies to all people in a community dealing with indigenous peoples. The Declaration is a significant affirmation of the rights of Native women, both as individuals and members of their indigenous communities, including rights to non-discrimination, 
gender equality, security of the person, and access to justice. Article 22 calls for particular attention to be paid to the rights and special needs of indigenous women and children in implementing all parts of the declaration. Violence against Native women and children is also specifically addressed in Article 22, which calls on countries to take measures in conjunction with indigenous peoples to ensure that Native women and children enjoy full protection against all forms of violence and discrimination. The right to be free from violence is one of the most basic human rights. It's a right that many in the United States uh, simply take for granted, but not Native women, who are two and a half times more likely to be assaulted and more than twice as likely to be stalked than other women in this country. One in three Native women will be raped in her lifetime, and six in ten will be physically assaulted. Even worse, on some reservations, the murder rate for Native women is ten times the national average. Although federally recognized Indian nations uh, have inherent sovereignty over their territories and people, their ability to protect Native women from violence and to provide them with meaningful remedies have been unjustly restricted by United States law. A root cause of this violence is the removal of tribal jurisdiction over crimes by non-Indians and other systemic legal barriers in U.S. law that have created a race-based jurisdictional maze about uh, which government, federal, tribal, or state, has the legal authority to respond to, investigate, and prosecute crimes. Some 88% of Native women identify their attackers as non-Indians, and according to the 2010 census, a growing and clear majority of the people now residing in Indian and Alaska Native areas do not identify themselves as American Indian or Alaska Native. Over 50% of Native women are now married to non-Indians and many more have non-Indian partners. This leaves tribes as the only governments in America without jurisdiction to combat certain types of domestic violence in their communities. Instead, federal laws force tribes to re rely exclusively on faraway federal and in some cases uh, state government officials to investigate and prosecute crimes of domestic violence that are being committed on tribal lands by non-Indians against Native women. Now add in the shamefully high federal declination rates for pr prosecuting crimes, with U.S. attorneys declining to prosecute 67 percent of the Indian country matters referred to them that involve sexual abuse. Under Public Law 280, which impacts the criminal justice system for 51 percent of the tribes in the lower 48 and potentially affects all Alaska Natives and their villages. Indian leaders and advocates have raised urgent concerns about failures of states to respond to and prosecute these crimes, especially those involving violence against Native women. Today, criminals act with impunity in Indian country threaten the lives of Native women daily and perpetuate an escalating cycle of violence in Native communities. Today, Native mothers must discuss with their daughters what to do, not if they are raped, but when they are raped. United States law denies Native people on Indian lands, especially Native women, their rights to security, equal treatment under the law, and access to meaningful justice. Native women who are victims of violence should not be treated differently just because they were assaulted on an Indian reservation. Serious and immediate changes in federal law and policy are needed. The Indian Law Resource Center and its partners, the NCAI Task Force on Violence Against Native Women, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and Clan Star Inc. have included a number of suggestions in our paper relating to violence against Native women and implementing the standards in the Declaration. I want to mention one in particular uh, related to jurisdiction and self-government. Uh, without an act of Congress, tribes cannot prosecute a non-Indian for domestic violence, even if that person lives on the reservation and is married to a tribal member. 
the United States could take an incremental step forward by enacting legislation that would restore the ability of tribes to respond to violence in their communities, especially these epidemic levels of domestic violence being committed against Native women by non-Indians. And these crimes uh, not only affect the women, but it's like a stone thrown in a pond. There's a ripple effect. It affects the families and the entire community and tribes. Currently, um, I just wanted to point out that such legislation has been introduced into the Senate. Um, and in fact, today, uh, the Senate is debating on the floor a uh, critical piece of legislation, S-1925, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, uh, which would fill that jurisdictional gap in Indian country, enabling certain tribes to exercise concurrent uh, jurisdiction over non-Indians, uh, that have ties to their community and who also commit misdemeanor crimes involving domestic violence, dating violence, and violation of protection orders. Um, so the Senate is debating that now. I had to turn off my phone so I don't know what's happening, but... Um, it, it looks like it may have passed. I know that... Um, <laughs> While there are many um, Native nations and allies in Congress that are working on this and advocating strongly for the passage of the bill, uh, please know that the bill's key tribal provisions are drawing strong opponents. And uh, these are opponents that would basically gut the tribal provisions out of the legislation. Uh, in closing, uh, we very much appreciate the Special Rapporteur's visit to the United States and are very grateful for your continuing commitment to the rights of indigenous peoples and the rights of indigenous women. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is Winsler Nosey, who's the councilman from the Peridot District of the San Carlos Tribe who also served as chair of the San Carlos Apache Tribe from 2006 to 2010. Thank you. I'm, I'm also very honored to be here. But uh, I guess, you know, with being a Native person, you're, you're always acknowledging your people back home. And, you know, we lost an individual who has been fighting for these kind of fights that we're all fighting for in Native country. And his name was Ernest Victor, and we lost him in a, a tragic accident and it's really sad when you lose that kind of member who's been a pioneer and being in the front line of a fight and uh, again I again I apologize because I sit here with with different emotions uh, because in life it comes to full circle and the reason why I say that is that when I first entered the University of Arizona building across I had to have my my brother push me into the building uh, because if you don't know the story uh, the, the, the St. Carl's Apaches had fought for a sacred mound, Mount Graham, and I was arrested on top of Mount Graham by the University of Arizona, U.S. Forest Service, and the county. And uh, from that point on, my life has totally changed about defending the, the rights of the Indian people and human rights. And uh, Ern, Mr. Victor was always right along the side that in this country, it has to change. I mean, so many times we sit in our office or we're away from the actual fight of survival. And when you're away, sometimes you, you, miss, you, you get away from the, uh, the core of what Indian people are suffering with. And, uh, but when we come back full circle, I, I do want to say to Rob, thank you. Because that tells me that, that there is a healing, that there is a process taking place. And I think it's from all the cries and, and, and participation of people who want to make change to make it better, better on both sides. Sometimes it's not enough, but those people who, 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 who work night and day to make a difference, you know, it, it does come about in, 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 a, in a slow process. And that's been 19 years since I've been on the University of Arizona uh, grounds here. So uh, I guess in a way, uh, it's good to be welcomed back. So again, thank you, I Rob. Thank you all for your <laughs> yeah, a hot breakfast. <laughs> and. Uh, I want to say, you know, also on the UN, you know, I really encourage the tribes to really take advantage because in, in 1993, uh, 94, 
I had the opportunity to go speak at the UN in Jakarta, Indonesia, where I ran for my life for a day and a half until they flew me out of there. And it was to talk about the spirit of the Indian people and the rights of the Indian people. But at that time, I didn't realize the, the impact that political powers have on both sides. And um, the UN ditched me, and the United States ditched me, and it was Spain that got me back to the United States. So I got to say thank you to Spain, of all people. So if you know the history of the West. So maybe it was something they felt they had to do. I don't know. But, um, but, but I guess, you know, for me, you know, I want to speak from the box and outside the box. And before I, I go over uh, the topics that I feel that's very important. And when I say in the box, I mean in the reservation. In the reservation. Because we are in confinement to live by rules. And how does those rules, and how can we adjust those rules to make a self-government, to have independency? Now, the bigger picture is outside the box, who we are, who we, God blessed us to be, and what is our inherent rights, our indigenous rights. And those two things, I think we can't misguide ourselves. Because if we do, then we're not educating the next generation of what's very, very important. Now, I would say that I was one that opposed it, my tribal government because of, of it being the right arm of the United States and suppressing our own people. So by not throwing wood to the fire is to take part and to take the initiative to make changes within our own tribal government. And that's when we began the healing project because what we found is that we, we have internal problems that are yet to be healed. So that falls back to being victimized, victimized from the past. Because if we still hold on to that, then we have yet to be really healed. So all these policies and everything that's coming down the road may not make sense to us because there's still some strong internal pro problems that we have. So the tribe took the initiative to turn around and began to address that self-healing so that we will not push that being victim to our children. Because I carry that same from my mother, from her mother. Because it's passed down from generation to generation. And that's why so many times we have social problems that we have. Because we have yet to blame the person who did this. And that's something that we can't forget. Because too many times as the chairman, I read reports and we blamed ourselves. We blamed ourselves that we couldn't do this. But if you look at the policies and procedures that govern us, makes a big difference. So what I ask everybody is, is to, to make sure that when you're discussing these things, from within the box and outside the box, but you cannot, you cannot forget the outside of the box. And I just want to end with saying on that, was driving my mother to California, to Oakland, where my older siblings were on that relocation uh, system, where they never returned. And so driving my mother to Oakland and bringing her back and us crossing the reservation line. And like all older people, they don't go to sleep. They want to make sure the driver's awake and we get home. And getting to the reserva reservation line, me telling her, hey, cool. we're, we're, we're home. And then her turning around to me and saying, they really train you good. We've been home a long time ago. <laughs> so. Those kind of things, you know, really, really affects you that, that we're, we're being taught to stay inside. And from the issue with the Mount Graham, and, and I mentioned this so many times in the spiritual fight, there has to be a uh, spiritual acknowledge of us because that's our identity. We, we can't, no matter what we do, we can't break from that. If we break from that, then we're no longer who we are. And so, that spiritual part plays a really important part in our children today. And, and that's something that, you know, that I must say, because that's what got me in trouble in Indonesia when I talked about God's greatest gift to the world, that everything is spiritual. And just saying that alone, I didn't realize that I was going to be running the whole night and the next day and not sleeping in my room. But that's what they held me accountable for in, in Jakarta, Indonesia. And, I, just want, I want to go on to some of the topics that I think from looking now within the box. I could talk to you about improvements within the government system that we live in currently.
but you are aware of that system. I want to I want to take this time to explain the repercussion of that current system and the causes, which is more beneficial to having an understanding in Indian country. When I talk about self-governance, you need to know where tribes and native people currently stand to begin with. There are several issues that I need to address. Land into trust, tribal lands are held in trust by the United States government. This causes the inability to have benefit of ownership. The United States economy is built on benefits and individuals or entities can gain from ownership of property. Because the tribe and its members cannot own land, it causes an inability to create its, its own economic base or be influential part of the United States economy. If you look at a land value, the tribe would have a strong economic base if the land was not currently valued and has having no value. Another aspect of the US economy is the ability to borrow money to begin business and have collateral. You can't borrow money without equity. The current system in, in benefiting to the United States, the current system is a benefit to the United States government because the United States government has control over the economy and the people. In order to become part of the US economy in the United States, uh, lifestyle, whether we want it or not, tribal entities and members must leave the reservation to own property. An example of control factor. On the reservation, you can, can be seen in the casino issues. The state and cities are trying to control when and where casinos to exist. There are currently lawsuits and litigations all over the United States regarding this issue and where casinos can exist. The United States government allows states to require tribes to pay out portions of the profits of, to cities, neighbors, neighboring towns, and entities. The other important uh, part that we see is the, alliance, is the reliance of the United States government. The United States government has built a generation of people to depend on, on government handouts and made this a norm for generations to generations on the reservation. The United States government has the control of the definition of Indian. There has been a division of races based on reservation boundaries that have been set by the United States government. There is an ongoing depletion of population by saying that you have to have a census number to be defined as an Indian in IHS to receive IHS and any other benefits. One example is a person half San Carlos Apache, half White Mountain Apache, but is only recognized as a quarter, meaning the children, even though they are full Apaches. The next generation will become smaller and smaller until none at all. The government within the United States boundaries rely on taxes, taxes and, running and running operations of a government. The U.S. relies on taxes, states relies on taxes, counties, cities rely on taxes, tribes rely on the United States government. The tribes have been given the opportunity to tax, but without ownership. How is this to work? Sale taxes without thriving economies is not supported by the government. Taxes benefits are allowed to American citizens, but in order to have these benefits, many rely on land ownership and ability to borrow, both of which is not likely on the reservation. Government to government. This is what the United States government is trying to establish for each of its department to work with the tribes. The United States government says that the tribes are sovereign entities, but in reality, the tribes are not sovereign with the United States government, and the U.S. government laws control tribal governments. The United States federal government has a trust, respons trust responsibility with the tribes, which is not a true trust relationship. The United States government is not separate, a separate entity which is not impacted based on the tribal benefits or failures. Example, if tribal lands are decreased, the United States government benefits from the gains of those lands. If the tribal funding is decreased, the United States government does not have to pay out as much. The United States government has a direct relationship with the tribe, so a true trust relationship does not exist. The United States government treaties, treats tribes like states for some things, but not all things. States and tribes completely are different. Both depend on the funding from the United States government, but tribes are supposed to be separate governments, sovereign. Example, states are subdivisions of the United States government. Tribes 
are on the same level of the United States government, but not treated as such. As an example, the United States government allows states some benefits, but not tribes. Another example, recognizing of state pension plans while tribes have not been allowed the ability to have their own. And the most important part, well, they're all important, but this tribal history is a part of the United States history, but not taught in schools. The, U the US population has a different perspective of Indian pre presence and ownership of the US lands. The government trust lands off reservations are currently being sought by states for jurisdiction. The tribes have been consulted regarding these lands, but the states and the people who govern them have no concept to these, to these areas where it was tribal land. All of the above issues affect the idea of self-governance is a priority. Yes, we can talk about the issue of improving current policies that exist within the system, but where the system itself is one that is imposed and affects the ability of self-government, the system is a downfall in Indian country and need to be addressed. So for us, those are just a few that are very important as tribes push for self-governance. And this is where I'm reflecting back to what is in the box and what is outside of the box. And that's something that, that we tribes, and with the opportunity that we have now with the UN being a part to work in a partnership with Indian tribe is to make sure we address those issues so that our people, our children, and the ones yet to be born will have a voice through us because there's no other way that it can change. And this is where I say, as of today, and I tell our people, we're still victims of the past. We are suppressed people, oppressed people. But we have to take that initiative in our hands to make a difference. And I commend all the people before me that have made this long pioneering effort in the human rights. And there are many that we may not know their names, but feel their spirits. And those spirits live through us. So in this session of this week, I really recommend it, even if you may not have a written document, is say what you need to say for your people. Because as he takes back the information, he will have a spirit with him because that's what cries out. On the, on the side of these policies and ordinance is our people cry. And so I cannot end this by saying I thank the creator. I thank all the people who have been touched. And, I'll, and I commend those and, that have stepped forward to work in this change so that Native American people can actually have a voice in this country. It's been long overdue. And if we become assimilated, then I tell you, from what it was told to us, all chaos will, will happen. Because there'll be no more morals in America. And the Amer Native American people are the only ones that are keeping that alive. So again, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to turn now to our scheduled speakers. I ask Jose Garcia, Blake Gentry, Richard Loarque, Frederick Torres Pestena, and Johnny Nazi to come please to the microphone. And as they come to the microphone, I would remind you that we are going to have to enforce the five minute limit and we do not intend to be disrespectful. We just want to provide opportunities to everyone who's traveled so far to be here. Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Garcia. I was elected as the Lieutenant Governor in June of 1993 of the Tohono <coughs> who live in uh, Mexico. Um, the Tohono in Mexico and our traditional form of government is are recognized by the <coughs> Tohono Nation as per the resolution passed in uh, 1995. 
Because this is kind of new for me. We join you today to submit the comments made by this um, written statement in, in recognizing the Tohono O'odham customary law in Article 36 of the U.S. Declar Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, which explicitly recognizes that a uh, geographical division of of indigenous territory does not uh, particularly uh, preclude the rights of the indigenous uh, divided by the international borders to maintain and develop contacts for political purposes, which their own members <coughs> as well as, in the, as other people across the borders. One issue that is damaging our communities is the <coughs> result of the lack of recognition by the Department of uh, Homeland Sec Security agents acting on the behalf of the United States of government of our rights to freely enter and exit the Tohono Reservation. The Tohono uh, O'odham Nation members who will have tribal ID cards issued by the Tohono O'odham Nation in compliance with our tribal registration uh, system approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, not affairs, are often physically detained and told point blanks that they are not are not, uh, do not have the right to be in the United States, although they are on their own tribal lands. The, the submitted report documents such actions. We are, are told that the custom border patrol officers assigned to patrol <coughs> our reservation and comment such statements have been properly oriented to our culture. However, they have demeaned, degraded, and attempted to humiliate the, our members by their inaccurate portrayal of the Tohono O'odham members who crossed the international borders from Sonora, Mexico, to the Tohono O'odham Reservation as being illegal aliens who are illegally entering their own territory. <coughs> Numerous complaints have been lodged through the office of the chairman of the Tohono O'odham Nation to contact custom borders patrol agencies under DHS authorized to release really wrongly detained individuals without whose rights have been violated. From our point of view, this ongoing practice is in the place to make it appear as if complaints mechanism is provided when there has never been, in our, to our knowledge, the action taken by DS against uh, BCP offices. The, uh, acting in, in the manner as a person who uh, are subjected on this form of radical, racial profi prof profiling in violation of our human rights, we have made it clear we are asserting our rights under the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, a declaration that the Tohono O'odham Nation is on record as supporting. This is on our, uh, 
that on our behalf, the Special Rapporteur Office communicates to the U.S. Department of State and to Mrs. Tihi, the current member of the President, Presidential Obama, Obama's Cabinet for Indigenous Affairs, these points. <clears throat> One, A, we maintain our rights to freely enter and accept the Tohono nations into Sonora, Mexico. We will con B, we will continue to defend our rights to hunt and gather food in, in, the, in the territory. Two, the, the, we request that all U.S. federal agency operating on the Tohono O'odham Nation establish communications with us by providing us with the relevant contact information for their representatives, representatives and the name and contact information of offices. We, three, we request that the Office of the UN Special Reporters for the right of the indigenous people respond in writing in to the violations we have submitted to the Office of the Special Rapporteur. <clears throat> Finally, we request that the Office of the UN Special Rapporteurs act as observers and help the facil facilitate an invitation to the U.S. government for a closed meeting with the traditional <coughs> leadership of the Autonomous in Mexico and their technical advisor to discuss, to discuss the response to our comp complaints based on our rights to, to consultation. Other parties invited to the meeting with the, uh, are the chairman of the nation, Autumn Nation, and the chairman of the Legislative Council. In that meeting, we propose to discuss the solutions of, of the misidentification of the Tohono O'odham tribal members as illegal <coughs> aliens and the monitoring mannequins to eliminate the abuses against and the and violation of our rights as indigenous people. And that's it. Thank <laughs> I'd you. like to apologize to that, to my reading of this. It's just that my vision isn't what it used to be, so I have to kind of <laughs> Thank you. do my best. Thank you. Mr. Gentry. Mr. Gentry. Thank you. I'd like to thank the offices of the Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples of the United Nations and the Rapporteur himself. The work that he does, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, the document that Mr. Garcia was uh, alluding to is a document that we have submitted uh, to those offices, and I will read a little bit of a summary from that. Uh, my position uh, at our organization, Gente de Itoy, uh, an Asociación Civil, a Mexican NGO, brings me into contact with Autum, who live in Sonora and who uh, cross into the reservation in the United States, and also with um, immigrant indigenous, mostly who come from Mexico and from Guatemala. Um, in our report, which is section three of a larger report, um, the report, the full report's name is Report on Human Rights Violations in Arizona, USA Related to International Migration. Section 3, which I'm going to summarize here, um, is Violations of the Rights of Citizens of Thon Autumn Nation and Other Indigenous Peoples. I know that there are other people today who will address some of these issues, so I won't go into some of the details, um, but I think it will just reiterate the points that they make in, um, today or tomorrow. Um, to summarize the violations of the rights of Thon Autumn Nation and other Indigenous Peoples related to immigration, um, we could say that our daily life for citizens of the Don Autumn Nation is interrupted by large presence of U.S. federal agents of various U.S. agencies on the Don Autumn Nation main reservation. Though the tribal government retains the right to control their own territory and all operations by other sovereign governments within their territory, their exercise of self-determination has been severely restricted due to the presence of federal agencies. Consultation between the Don Autumn Nation and federal authorities that normally do not operate on the indigenous reservations in the United States lacks substantive protocols to protect international human rights standards under the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous and the, and the uh, Convention on Civil and Political Rights. 
the free transit of Tonawatam citizens for everyday activities, including access to religious and historic sites, transit to school bus stops, travel to and from the Tonawatam Nation main reservation, for visitation of relatives hospitalized in intensive care, are all impaired by the routine practices of the Department of Homeland Security and subdivisions of the U.S. Border Patrol, ICE agents, Immigration Customs Enforcement agents, presence of the Drug Enforcement Agency, the periodic station of National Guard units, and other such entities as of yet unidentified, un uh, which in their totality constitute a military force de jour within the Tonawatam Nation main reservation. The daily stopping of Tonawatam Nation tribal members in their personal vehicles, as well as the disregard for the jurisdiction taught in the sovereignty of the Tonawatam Nation police regarding the right of tribal members to carry arms for hunting, constitute possible violations of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Other alleged violations include disproportionate targeting of indigenous Yaquis, this is outside the uh, Tonawatam Nation Reservation but within Arizona, disproportionate targeting of indigenous Yaqui in the community of Guadalupe, Arizona, and the language rights of non-Spanish and non-English speaking immigrant indigenous detained by U.S. Border Patrol and ICE agents, and legally processed in U.S. Dist, uh, streamlined court proceedings um, located in downtown Tucson, Arizona and other places in the United States. The operational transfer of funds from the Department of Homeland Security to the Autumn Nation Police Force related for work related to migrants on the Autumn Nation does not constitute a prior consultation as set out by the articles in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Finally, historical hardship placed on Autumn Nation living in Sonora, Mexico, who are both documented and undocumented members of the Autumn tribe have not been provided with verifiable identification that allows for their free passage to visit Autumn communities in Arizona and on the Tonawatam Nation Main Reservation and the non-contiguous San Javier District of the Tonawatam Nation. Members from Mexico with tribal identification cards have been harassed, they've been uh, physically abused and told they do not have the right to be on the Tonawatam Nation Main Reservation by officials of the United States government. Our NGO has produced two videos that give case examples of human rights violations against indigenous in Arizona. Uh, they're on YouTube under the channel HR Social Media 7, and they're viewable by the public. They are two of 15 cases that we've documented in the, in the document that we've submitted to the office. I've got a minute left, so I want to mention there are nine areas in which we've documented violations of the Declaration by our interpretation. The ninth is about native language rights. Um, a quick estimate of the number of indigenous immigrants who are in the United States is 330,000 people which would constitute the largest block of indigenous in the United States. Uh, we get that by looking at the percentage of indigenous in Mexico, 11 to 13 million times 21 percent or up to 30 percent of those who are considered indigenous, research done by people in the United, and by this university in Altar, Sonora. Those people, when they are apprehended and detained, uh, they have rights under the Declaration, they have rights under the UN Convention on the Rights of Migrants and Their Families, we believe those rights are being violated in the apprehension, um, in those hearings and in detention. Specifically in the hearings, uh, few to no um, translators are provided for people who do not speak Spanish or English. They're asked the question sorry, about their ability to speak uh, any language in a language they don't speak. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Larkey. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Nayo. Uh, good afternoon, um, Mr. Nayo. Our guest here, Kaiho and Atag Strash, from Tohina Mesh, Tana Tese, Koets, it's a Koiko, Mr. Toy, I, Nashia, Nuana, Mat, and Kai. It's good that we're here all today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm the governor for the Pueblo of Laguna. Um, in, in, in response to the opportunity that we have here today, um, looking specifically at responsibilities and, and how we begin to look at implementing um, these, these opportunities we have as it relates to the United Nations. One of the things that we look at and I thought about and, and hearing you speak before, Mr. Nye, and you talk about going from a period of uh, non-recognition, recognition, um, uh, realization of those rights and then a responsibility of those rights. Um, I, I think there's also another step that's in there and that's a realization of responsibilities. <laughs> And, and what, what, what I mean by that is, you know, we've, we've gone from a stage of, of what the gentleman was talking about earlier of being subordinate, being reactive, being controlling type of governments from, from a tribal side as opposed to being those types of governments that are 
not subordinating, but emancipating, that are enabling. And, and those, that is where I believe we've forgotten as a people the com not only the confidence, but the competence that we've been given by our creator. When they created us, they, they bestowed these abilities on us. We have that confidence. We have that competence. And that's a responsibility to draw on those things. Um, you know, we, we come from a people, uh, in particular the Pueblos, that built Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde. And, and this is a real example in our Pueblo where we had, not too long ago, we had a, an individual, and, and mind you, she was an elder, so we, this is why we responded. We had an elder call our public works department and ask if someone can go to her home and change the light bulb. Got to the home, grandson, 20-some years old, laying on the couch. Won't change it. We've gone from a people that have built Chaco Canyon and the villages that still stand today to being so dependent on the government that they need us to go change a light bulb. What happened? We've disabled our people by controlling them, by using the, the, the lessons of colonization, the lessons of subordination, as opposed to emancipation and competence. And so we, we need to get back to that element of being responsible to those things because if not, we can't be responsible to be in the true government. We're, we only, we end up playing government. And, and so, and one of the examples I would give to that, and right now one of the big areas is healthcare. The Indian Health Service, we see through trust responsibility, through the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, through the IHA, all these things, we have a right to healthcare. But Indian Health Service is only funded to 54% of its need. And those funds are discretionary. So how do we get responsibility back on that piece? It's, it's, to me, it's kind of like a baseball game. And I, and I look at, and thank you for these, uh, these are pretty neat. Um, Article 18, indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights. This is kind of like a baseball game right now. Tribes are on the baseball field and they're playing. But the umpires are the federal government. They're changing the rules. You could hit a home run right down center field and they're gonna call it out of bounds. How is it that we get back to being able to, we be the umpires as well, and we go to an umpires association so that we have the right to have a say in what the rules are and not it be changed in us. That is a very important element as part of implementation. We're playing the game as best we can, but we're not even the umpire. So um, th those are key elements for us. And, and the last piece that I think about is when, when I look at these, these articles and, and just even our daily lives, those things we already have, we want a say in how we worship, how we pray, how we govern, how we raise our families. We call that sovereignty. Western society calls that freedom. Isn't it just a language thing? Do we need to talk a different language to be able to maybe take away the intimidation of power when we talk sovereignty to talk in a common language that they understand? And it's that part of the implementa implementation piece. So th those are the thoughts that um, I, I would like to share with you this afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you and, and share our thoughts on behalf of the Pueblo of Laguna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Torres Pistana. Aloha. Mahalo. In those two words you hear, ha. My breath of life, ha. I want to share with you to that today that and my brother who said the opening prayer and he said my world my world is our world I come from a little bitty island in the middle of the Pacific and I walk on Turtle Island and we have the same problems we have where I come from a government that has belligerently occupied my kingdom my nation for 109 years and they still threaten us every day 
they threaten my, lead my leaders with messages on the phone that they have a bullet with their name on it. We, we get letters in the mail saying, watch our back, they're gonna kill us. But we're not afraid. For me, I went to Vietnam, I know what fighting for America is like. America is one of the most dishonest nations in the world, causing the most wars on this planet. So I asked Mr. Anaya, when you go to speak to the people you have to report to, tell them my story. Tell them our story in the middle of the Pacific. We have these words called aloha and mahalo, and many more sacred words. We would like to share that with the world. In 2013, there's a double haul canoe that will travel around the planet telling the people of all the different countries of our culture and the word of law and the peace we want to make for this planet. This, this island is just, this planet is just an island in this universe. And if we let America and the greed of other nations keep on doing what they're doing, they're gonna sink our islands. They're already destroying the turtle in my home. I have turtle tattoos on my back. And the tatawa, the tattoos on our bodies tell stories. And the animals and relations in the ocean, when they die and float to the surface and land on the shores, their ears are all blown out because the United States military are doing sonar testing under the water, killing our relationships, killing our relatives in the ocean. I always use the words malama oke kai, cherish the sea. In Hawaii, we have a word called vai. That means water. The same word said twice, vai vai is wealth. Water is our wealth. The biggest threat right now, we have over 400 something nuclear plants on our island, this planet. And next is water. They're polluting water everywhere. So Mr. Anaya, when you go to speak to your American, uh, the American government. Please come to my nation and speak to the people who represent and have honored me to be here to speak for them and listen for them. I ask that all us, so we, the word indigenous, we have a hard time with that because my kingdom, my ancestors, or it's based on many, many different peoples from all over the world coming and becoming citizens of the Hawaiian kingdom. It was also the first peoples, the brown people, first brown people on this planet to be recognized as a kingdom, as a government. Everyone could speak. We had light bulbs before America did. Our history gets very, very pure. But also, one of my relatives put the islands together he had to go to war to bring our people together. And after he became a warrior, he became a farmer. In the history books, how America translates our history. They make him a hero, he is a hero, but they also make and displace a lot of our true history. We are not Americans, and no disrespect to the Native Americans here, but many of us are not Americans. When I first spoke against the policies of America in the early 70s, there was less than 50 I could count and learn from. And now there are thousands of us becoming Hawaiian nationals, not Americans. So thank you for giving me the chance to tell my story because there are many, my, my elders would like to be here too. And some of my young, some of our young warriors and our young sister warriors, Wahini warriors. They would love to be here too. But the economics of traveling and the economics of greed want my kingdom. My kingdom will never go away. My kingdom is here to teach the world the peaceful ways of my ancestors. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you. Thank you. Could I call the next five to come down and while Mr. Nays gets ready to speak? Scott Taylor. James Zion, Lita O'Daniel, Leonard Benali, David Laughing Horse Robinson, and Kai Landau. Mr. Nazi.
My name is Johnny Nays. I'm the, the speaker of Navajo Nation Council. And I'm here uh, representing the Navajo Nation Council and, and the people. I want to thank the, the special rapporteur, Mr. Anaya, for hearing us out today. The Navajo Nation, for over a decade, has advocated for endorsement and implementation of Navajo, uh, United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People domestic, domestically and in internationally. The area that Navajo Nation believes that declaration can correct the wrong of the United States law and policies is in the area of self-determination as it relates to land, territories, and resources. The exercise of the rights to self-determination is an inalienable fundamental and inherent rights of the indigenous nation and people. Indigenous nations such as Navajo nations have written and unwritten fundamental traditional laws and policies which regulates our internal affairs of our resources. However, the U.S. laws and policies limits and restricts the full exercise of Navajo Nation laws and policies. This prevents us from to freely pursue our economics, social, and cultural development. The indigenous nation existed before the colonization of indigenous land and territories, and indigenous people have exercised self-determination since time in the moral. The United States has stated in several form, nationally and internationally, that it recognizes the rights to self-determination of in indigenous people. However, the rights to self-determination in, in the United States is often and always ignored by statutes and laws which restricts the Navajo Nation. An example of this imposition of self-determination is when Navajo Nation was deprived of a right and authority to freely exercise the full authority and management of surface and subsurface resources. Navajo Nation challenged the United States unfair dealings when it negotiated, renegotiated the mineral lease with the coal company. The United States Supreme Court declined to review the United States Court of Appeal, uh, United States Court of Appeal's decision. And the Supreme Court said the Navajo Nation was treated fairly by the, by the coal company and denied Navajo Nation the opportunity to correct the wrong committed by the, by the United States government. Our position on this issue is substantiated by Article 3 of the Declaration which states indigenous people have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. With that in closing, it is the position of Navajo Nation that the United States should change its current laws and, and policies and offer recommendation on ways to implement Article 3 of the Declaration. In addition, I recommend the United States conduct a comprehensive review of its law and policies and ensure that the United States is in compliance with all international standards. Again, in closing, I appreciate and thank the Special Rapporteur, and, uh, Mr. Anaya, uh, for his report to the United Nations Human Rights Council and also in discussion about our sacred San Francisco peak and the use of the recycled wastewater to produce artificial snow for recreation. And I thank you for hearing us out, Mr. Anaya. And I have, I uh, believe I have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I have one minute left. I see in the United Nation, there's a whole lot of flags that are flying around the building. So I have a Navajo Nation flag I'd like for you to place up 
up on the, in with the, all the flags. So, <laughs> so if you could, so this is from the Navajo Nation, Mr. Naya. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. Is Mr. Scott Taylor here? Mr. Zion. This is not a short person microphone. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to speak to self-government as an aspect of self-determination in a way to really reinforce some of the points that Jana Walker made <coughs> earlier about the ability of indigenous government to resolve its own problems when it has the ability to do so. And following upon the words of the speaker of the Navajo Nation, I'd like to offer the Navajo Nation as an example of how self-governance, self-determination can work well. The first example I want to offer is the Navajo Nation legal system, and particularly its court system, that has long been a leader, not simply in articulating law, but in articulating principles of indigenous law. We are fortunate to have in this room the author of the first book on indigenous law that has been published, Justice Raymond D. Austin, sitting behind me. <laughs> An outstanding work that shows that indigenous law is real, it is something that is not mysterious. It is something that can be learned <coughs> even by non-Navajos such as myself, who is an active practitioner in the Navajo Nation judicial system. I want to offer the second example of successful self-determination in the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. And we are fortunate to have the chair and at least two members of the commission present with us today. The Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, and, and I used to work for the Montana Human Rights Commission, is an unusual body in that it, it seems to have no powers as such in terms of investigating complaints or taking action on complaints. Yet the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission has taken a leadership role in the United Nations, as you know, Mr. Anaya, and in this region, by advocating for <coughs> human rights in a very effective way. And it is an example of what a national human rights commission should look like. And an example for the United States, as I believe the United Nations has pointed out. The third area I wish to address that Mr. Nazi touched on just a bit is the use of traditional law in the Navajo Nation. And you may be aware of a document called the Fundamental Laws, which is a Navajo Nation creating a statutory vehicle to really make traditional law live. But more particularly, I want to return to an action of the Navajo Nation Council in addressing the issue of, well, what are we going to do about principles of good governance? And they did have the model of the United Nations principles of good governance, but the Navajo Nation decided to do something different. It codified traditional Navajo principles of good governance, and those are in place, and I hope to see, as a practitioner, I hope to see them enlarge. But I simply want to end my time by making some suggestions. One suggestion for indigenous governments and for self-determination is for them themselves to embrace the principles of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Indian country today has gone so far a few years ago as to say that tribes should themselves adopt the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And why should they do that? I represent individuals and civil society organizations where we are trying to point to standards to carry good governance forward. 
I would want to suggest that the Declaration, and particularly its principles of open governance, inclusion, participation, and getting informed consent is a way to go to enhance it. Because at the end of the day, and as hackneyed as this may sound, the notion that governments can be laboratories for change and laboratories to point out ways to go is true, and I simply offer the example of a nation that I am proud to serve as a private practitioner, no matter what conflicts we might have. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Daniel, Lita O'Daniel. Um, yeah, uh, uh, hello, my people and the people from the United Nation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Lita O'Daniels, and I'm from Big Mountain XPL, stands for Hopi Petition Land. And uh, I have a few things It really has been an issue out there. And one is, number one would be uh, would be those um, uh, the issue is the water right, 2109, and uh, the, the government trying to give our water away without really explaining which area it is. And there is a um, uh, Colorado River, and there's water where we live, which is Navajo Aquifer. And, uh, We're trying to tell them that these waters are sacred and they are put there for us by the holy people. And um, we're trying to hold on to it because our, we need it for uh, ourselves, for the key, for the children and the future, our future pre kids, grandchildren, and so on. And we use for livestock, and we use for our garden, things like that. And uh, lately, there has not been very much rain, so the water is very, very short up there, pretty much. And also, on the reservation, we have no water line, so we have to go a distance to haul water in a barrel to our home for our use, for our animals. So we are having a lot of problem with that and uh, if they take our water and pipe it up somewhere other cities we would not have very much water and uh, we might have to go a longer way to get water and uh, at the price of the gas and these days it's just going to be really hard we just won't have no water for ourselves for our children and for the livestock so this has really been a big issue. It's really been bothering me as a grandmother. So that's number one. And uh, also there is uh, the reference to Peabody and the Navajo Generating Station. And the proposed agreement should be deleted because Peabody and Navajo Generating Station are not a party to the water right settlement. Number two, let the Peabody Navajo Generating Station be negotiated in separate time with the Re Navajo tribe regarding to the use of Navajo lands, water, minerals, and uh, any other resource need to be deleted from the agreement they've been trying to push at us. And also, in addition to that, all the tax paid by the Peabody and the Navajo Generating Station to the state should be should go to the, the tribe instead of going to the other cities that has nothing to do with us. So we are very short on the funds on education for our children too. So that's what I that's the number one that's the issue that is 
I want to talk about. And also, I am Laasa I'm from Hopi Petition Land, and um, which uh, had to do with the the people up there, and so myself. I am one of the, the from uh, Navajo. Then, oh, I can't see that. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. I'm from uh, the HPL, which stands for Hopi Petition Lands, and uh, we are having no electricity, no running water, like I said, and uh, we are still hauling water and uh, wood and stuff like that to our homes, and uh, our children had to go away and go to school, and uh, also, uh, we just having a lot of problems, which it should not be. It, with the Human Rights Commission, they come around and we tell them our province, and they seem like our governor are not listening to us. The governor from uh, Washington, D.C., they set up fund for us to be uh, rehabilitated from um, land come, uh, I'm sorry. It, uh, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. To rehabilitate and then uh, our U.S. Our Navajo government, they just use it for something else, like building a casino, and I use it for something else, and we don't see any of that money that we're supposed to be, it's supposed to be used for us. And also, the last time with the land commissions, and, uh, and uh, they went around, and uh, they did not tell us that. These are money, these funds are came from Washington, D.C., and those are for our use. They just came around and say, there is money out there, and uh, how do you want to use it? And they did not explain these are the money for the elders, supposed to be used by the elders, for the elders. and. Uh, how do you want to use this money? And we said, we want the water, we want a better road, we want a better home. And uh, this is all what we said. I remember I said that too. And then it turned out they were used for casino. And uh, after the casino, all the money that went to casino, after the income start coming probably in 10, 20 years from now, a lot of those elders are suffering out there are not going to see that. And I don't know our children is going to be able to see that. That's one thing that is one that really bothered me too. Thank you, Mrs. Daniel. We so appreciate your testimony. It just so that's one thing I want to say. And I also am um, come from um, a person that is um, my people, my mother, my father, grandmothers went through all that dispute, and uh, if it wasn't for uh, their teaching, their sacred teaching, we would not even able to survive. A lot of them are gone. They just don't, they're not just not around no more because they struggle and struggle and struggle. And their strength just gone and they just, they're just gone, so we're just, Mostly the young people and people at my age are left out there, pretty much. So I just really like to see that my government treat us better. I like to get some respect. I like to get some recognition. And I like for us to have a better life. This is what I like to see. So there is a lot of issue, but I just can't go on and go on because they're just there's so much that had to be done out there, and just so much suffering is still going on. And lots of people don't realize that these things are going on. So that's what I like to say. And um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Benali. Thank you.
offer and allow me the opportunity to present on self-government. I would like to address failures of the U.S. government to resolve problems for Navajo people living in the Hopi partition land on the Navajo Nation. Our history presents the tangles of webs, corporate and governmental collusion to relocate traditional people, traditional Navajo people from our ancestral land. So Peabody Coal Company could mine coal water so far away city could prosper. John Boyton served as an attorney for Peabody Coal Company and the Hopi tribe at the same time committed fraud on the court, not telling the courts about the two law lawsuits litigated at the same time to sell lands, including acres of the HPL and the value of coal beneath the ground as a taken by the U.S. government before the Indians Claims Commission getting half the land back in the former joint use area in Healy versus Jones. Forced relocation by the U.S. government is a too high of a price to pay to steal our land so far away city can prosper. Even through we have rights to vote as citizens. In 1974, the U.S. Court of Appeal rule in Hill versus Jones said, we only have rights through our tribes, but not as individual. Instead of being able to own properties, the Navajo and the Hopi Tribal Council have the authority to lease land on behalf of their tribal members. Both tribes estimate $10 billion in coal deposit beneath our land. Water used to support mining is depleting and degrading the pristine ice age water from our sole source aquifer. <coughs> Ever since the mining started, we've, we have been living without electricity or running water. Shores have been capped it off on the surface ground water supply depleted depleted and washes contaminated from arson and other heavy metals. The humans and animals in Big Mountain, we have, we do not have any safe drinking water. We are forced to travel long distance or drink water we suspect is contaminated. Too many people have died without health assessment done of the respiratory problems, black lung, silicosis cancer, kidney failure, despair, suicide, in the name of pursuit of high coal and royalties. The, the U.S. Department of Energy calls our land a national sacrifice area at the heart of global warming issue. Our community are a microcodes, microcosm of the global problem. The energy is produced on our land using our resource, yet we have no benefit from this activity. We suffer at the local cost of this production, such as environmental damage to our land, degradation, diminution of our water source, and the interference with sovereignty. We have that are we have that our traditional lifestyle hanging on the edge of survival in an arid climate, and the scientists predicts that global warming can cause a permanent drought dust bowl in the American Southwest, making our ways of life impossible. Wars of the future will be fought over water as they're fought over oil today as water, the blue gold, the source of human survival either in the global market. Currently, the president, Ben Shelley of the Navajo Nation is work, working with Senator Kyle and the legislation for the Little Colorado Water Rights Settlement that gives our water to Bee Potty Coal Company and the NGS. We believe that the settlement is a tragedy 
not only due to the minimizing Navajo rights, but wavering hundreds of millions of dollars in potential compensation over rights wavered. Our liberty has been sacrificed for an economic bonanza based on fraud, corruption. Our justice has been prostituted by handout hopelessness, conformity elevated to the status of the national security doctrine. We are the historical law of dispossessed. Democracy has been whitewashed it with imported detergent that allows reclaim sewer water to get dumped on our sacred San Francisco peak. I offer my heartfelt hope for democracy, freedom for all indigenous people in struggle. I believe if the voice of all that dispossessed it comes together in one voice, nothing would be standing of the gigantic lies. Death and misery is the historical law of the dispossessed. It. I want freedom and justice for my people and the right to self-governance of indigenous autonomy like our ancestor did. <laughs> Recommendation. The Navajo Nation should adopt the declaration as their standard for addressing the water rights issue such as the proposed Little Colorado Water Rights Settlement. Introduce it as Senator Bill 2109 and House Resolution 4067. Peabody Coal Company should be held accountable for the trademarks and left behind the legacy of corporate crimes against the indigenous people of Black Mesa. And respectfully, thank you. Thank you. Standing here. We can go with the United Nations as long as we get the vote also. The lack of our ability to vote on the United Nations is evident that we need even more change. The Kauaisu tribe of Tahone, I'll reword that, the Kauaisu nation of citizens needs to be respected equally. We're not just some dog Basing ourselves up here just worthlessly and begging for crumbs. We're standing here because we do have the right to demand basic human rights. Humanity is what's on the line. Do we cut off our tongue so we cannot talk? Or should we? Maybe. If it's not being heard, cut it off then they can't get much more out of us. They can't use us for slaves anymore. We're not the dog. We signed a treaty in 1849. It was ratified. Not one word was kept. One, six months later, we were held as slaves. We were thrown into a cavern of land that they said, oh yeah, you'd be left alone there. You'd be treated humanely. Right. So they took our children and sold them. Under California law, the United States sent their superintendent of Indian Affairs to Tahone Reservation. And there, they said we would be safe. He sold the Indian children. The older people that couldn't work, the ones that were sick, were slaughtered because they were worthless. The only value they had was the ability to be able to work. 40,000 of us died there in two mass graves of 20,000 each. And in 2009, guess what? The county of Kern. And Arnold Schwarzenegger took his little payoff too, by the way, and gave those same graves that to the same exact people that slaughtered us. So the property of our dead now belong to the county and the state. Not what you're saying. Your land is being taken by local governments because the federal government stands back and takes a look. I guess the only arena we do have is the international arena. We go to a court. That court is owned by the United States government. 
You go to a court and then you try to fight for your rights there. They turn right around and say, oh, well, you're fighting for the tribe, so you need an attorney because it's a class action suit. To a tribe that has nothing left, nothing, stripped of everything, they're taking it all now your right to even argue. We can't afford attorneys. Well, I'm the first one in my tribe out of 100,000 that are still alive today to go to college. Never had the opportunity. I fought. I lived in my pickup to go to college. There's no funds. You know, that's a joke. Indians get all this money. It's only crumbs. And it's not their money to give to us to begin with. It's our money they use against us. This is not their nation. This is our nation. Under our creator. Pogma Togma got. Creator knows. And the violations are many. Uh, according to the declaration. There's 21 violations. Article 31, oh, I'm going to give it up here. The right to protect and develop cultural heritage in, is violated by language in the government's environmental law doc, documents stating that the corporation owns the remains of indigenous Native Americans. Articles 5, 6, 9, 27, 28, 33, and 40 regarding violations of prompt decisions making with fair and just procedures. This pertains to the ability and capricious, the arbitrary and capricious application of the regulations of the U.S. government's Department of Interior's Indian Affairs process for placing tribes on the list of being recognized. Articles 8, 10, 11, and 12 regarding access and use of ceremonial objects, remains, and rights of repatriation of remains. Articles 13, 28, 32, 37, 39, where states ensure that indigenous are consulted with good faith and understanding in political, legal, and administrative proceedings and provide financial assistance to achieve enforcement of treaties and redress of, viol of violations this would be better served if the United States acknowledged its treaty obligations to the Kauai and defend our rights instead of leaving us to file our own lawsuit at our own expense. Article 24, 25, and 26, providing protection for intellectual property and protection for in indigenous rights to medicine plants, minerals, and spiritual relationships with sacred sites and traditional lands, reserves, and allotments. Articles 29 is basically the environmental issues that they re refuse to address. But the main thing here is the honor of a great man. Thank you. You're really sticking your neck out. And you got a hard job. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Landau. You're taller than me. Aloha kako. Pupukahi i holomua. That's what we say is that together we move forward. So I want to first acknowledge that we're on the land, the sacred land of your ancestors, that we stand on their bones. We must acknowledge that. And acknowledge that we're really honored to be invited by all these great nations that stay in this, because we're I'm honored to speak for my elders who have sent me here. And what they say is when they look over in this country, they see your nations. They don't see America, because they know their nation, Hawaii, Kohoe Pai Aina. And so when they look over here, they see Navajo, they see Apache. You know. And what they say to tell me is that they need your help. And they also want to offer you their help, because together we're going to make this. And if this declaration is going to live and have life, we have to give it life. The United States is not interested necessarily in it having life. It may benefit from it having life in the end. But I think this is something we have to consider. We have to consider 
making the institutions a mechanism that start to address those ideals of rights. And so we're going to these clashes of rights with America, that it's us who start this process of institutions, of courts of remedy, of you know, processes of, of sitting down at the table, leveling the playing field. If we don't level the playing field, who will? They can say no to us, but we can say yes to ourselves. And we can say yes to a process that we put our manao, our thinking into it, so that it knows us. And so those ideas know us, and they know who we are. And then from there, we can maybe start that discussion on a level playing field uh, to come to these kind of, to deal with the, the mass of suffering. Because what we share in Hawaii with you nations is the same oppressor. But that same oppressor is also our people too. They're mixed with our blood, they're mixed with our people, they're mixed with our lives, you know. And so they have to share the, the future in a positive way, but coming from us, who are the ones who start to start to create this. I mean, the, we have this, these people who write, who, who are created institutions of legal learning. And those things can be part of these institutions. So that's my suggestion. That's what my elders came, had me to express to you, this desire to expand the process out of Hawaii into the world. And so for that, we say mahalo for having us here. Aloha. Thank you. Just to follow up on uh, some information given to me that Jana Walker mentioned earlier, I have, I've been told that the Senate Bill 1925 was passed by a vote of 68 to 31 in the Senate. Uh, and I want to thank all the speakers and panelists for being here, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break and then reconvene about 4 o'clock here in this room for the next panel. For those of you who spoke, if you, have not, if you have a written statement that you have not already turned in, if you would turn it in at the registration desk in the lobby across the courtyard, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you.